This is the Millennial Millionaire Through Real Estate Podcast. A whole lot of people have just know about GTD but haven't implemented it because life's okay. Ambient anxiety is okay. Overwhelm would not be. Real overwhelm would not be okay. But ambient anxiety, they're willing to tolerate. That's why, you know, I, I've, I've often said it's people's addiction to stress that keeps them from implementing this stuff. You're listening to the Millennial Millionaire Through Real Estate Podcast, where we discuss tangible tips, tricks, and best practices for becoming financially free. The show is designed for people who want to either start real estate investing or for those who want to scale their real estate business. What's going on, everyone? This is Jonathan Farber, your host of the Millennial Millionaire Through Real Estate Podcast. I hope you're all well and healthy. For any first-time listeners, thanks for being here. The goal of this show is to explore ways to become financially free through real estate or to increase passive cash flow through real estate. A little background on myself, I work in corporate America at a software company and my side hustle is real estate. I currently own eight rental units and looking to add more this spring. I have house hacked, bird, flipped, and done short-term rentals to name a few strategies. My current focus is 20 to 30 unit apartment buildings in Ohio and Kentucky. I love to network and learn. So if you'd like to connect further, feel free to find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Bigger Pockets. All right, guys, here's an episode I was looking forward to for a really long time. Uh, some of you guys may or may not know this, but I am sort of a productivity freak, nerd, whatever you want to call it. And David Allen happens to be one of the people that I would put on my Mount Rushmore of systems and productivity. The only other one I could think of, which I'm looking at his book right now, is Peter Drucker, who wrote The Effective Executive. Um, but David Allen has an amazing system that we get into in this episode today. And I'm really hoping you guys can pull some things from to add and implement into your daily practice and your daily life. Uh, a little background on David, uh, trying to sum this up as best I can, pulling from a couple places. David is one of the world's most influential thinkers on productivity. David's 35 years of experience as a management consultant and executive coach have earned him the title of personal productivity guru by Fast Magazine and top five coaches from Forbes Magazine. The American Management Association has ranked him among the top 10 business leaders in the past 25 years. His best-selling book, The Art of Getting Things Done, has been published in over 30 languages, and his systems of getting things done, GTD, has become a global phenomenon taught now in over 75 countries. David is dedicated to teaching people on how to become more productive and stress-free stress in a fast-paced, cluttered world. You will hear that time and time in this episode, and that is the main thing that actually stood out to me from this episode is how he deals with stress, pressure, or anxiety. And the thing that uh, I found so interesting in this episode was the concept that he talks about, which is ambient anxiety, and how there is anxiety in the background at all times that you may not know about or may not know why you feel it unless you're able to diagnose it and put a button on it and figure out what your next step is or how you can get, get it out of your head and into your system and then figure out what your next step is and how you're going to actually take action on it. So I thought that was really interesting. I'd never heard it talked about. And now listening to his work in a couple other places, it's a concept he talks about, but really resonated with me when uh, I've had just a lot going on the last couple of months and couldn't figure out sometimes why I felt stressed or why I felt nervous or just couldn't sleep at night. And using this system has really helped me clear my head and think through some of the things that were bothering me. Okay, so today's tangible tip, going through organization, I felt this was fitting. Uh, I watch a lot of YouTube for learning, um, do-it-yourself videos, just general anything in real estate and business. But uh, what I have found to help organize these videos and see what I've watched and, and go back to it is two things. One, organizing playlists in YouTube of videos that either resonate with a project I'm working on or just a general theme in my life. So for example, one of them, I have a playlist of different projects that I think I can do on my rental properties, stuff that I think anyone can do, but stuff that I actually think has a high impact on what I'm going to be doing in the next quarter. So any video I watch on that, I not only like, but I add to this playlist. And another little tracking feature that I've found in using YouTube videos is Sometimes I don't have a place for it, but I do want to understand or, or be able to tell if I've seen that video before. So what I'll do is either just like or dislike the video. And that way, when you come back to it the next time, 
you'll see or remember, have I watched this or have I liked it or is it worth watching again? And that's helped me a lot because I've gone back to videos that maybe I watched two or three years ago and I didn't really remember what the video was about, but I remember I disliked it. So right there it told me I wasn't really into it at the time. Maybe it's not worth watching again or I did like it and now it is worth watching again and maybe I can gain something from it or refresh something that I liked back then. So that's today's tangible tip. You guys know I love YouTube, but I think there's so much good learning and information on there that can save you guys so much time and energy that I try to do every day. So without any further ado, incredible episode today with one of my legend and idol figures, David Allen. All right, David, welcome to the podcast. Jonathan, delighted to be here. Thanks for the invitation, sure. Yes, excited to have you. As I do with most guests, just do some note-taking and review of how and where I first heard your name or the guest name. And like I said before we hit record, I think it was on the Tim Ferriss podcast. Maybe he referenced it in 4-Hour Workweek. But uh, since then, just been uh, an adopter of some of your methodologies and strategies in the book and then a lot of video content. You've done many interviews, but um, excited to have you on, dig into some of these strategies today. For those that don't know you, you mind just giving a quick background on uh, who you are and how you got into all this and uh, then where you're at today. Sure. Well, I'm David Allen, and uh, about 35 years ago, after having 35 jobs, I decided the only job for me was being a consultant. So, uh, you know, popped into that world and uh, was really more interested sort of in my own self-development. Uh, you know, I was at, this was Berkeley in the late 1960s and early 70s, so heady times to be in Berkeley and, you know, focus on that kind of stuff. And that was my primary focus, if you will, but they, nobody was paying anybody to do, you know, personal exploration. Uh, so I had to pay the rent. So that's why I wound up having 35 jobs was I just wound up, I, I, I had people who I knew in my network that needed some help in their businesses, their startups and so forth. So I became a really good number two guy. And I would just show up and say, well, how much easier can, can we make this so I can leave earlier? Now they call that process improvement. Uh, I'm just lazy, uh, but you know that it, I work. It, it, that worked. Then I'd fix it, and then I get bored, and then go find another job. So then I discovered they pay people to do that. They call them consultants. So you know, couldn't spell it. Now I are one. You know, hung out my shingle, 1981, 82, something like that. Uh, Allen Associates, and of course, I was also very interested as a consultant not having any traditional sort of NBA kind of training at, at all. I was curious to find really good models that, that really worked. So if it wasn't clear how to help somebody, if I walked into their enterprise, uh, I could pull out something out of my back pocket and say, okay, well, let's walk through, let me walk them through this process. So I got very hungry for those processes. I'm also very hungry for stuff that would keep me sane as my life was getting more complex because I'd, I'd gotten a black belt in the martial arts and, and karate and was doing spiritual meditative practices and so forth. I love the idea of clear space, having a clear head, having nothing on your mind, having, you know, the room and the freedom essentially to, to explore, you know, inner realms and all that good stuff. And, uh, but the complex world was kind of getting in the way of that. So I was looking for techniques for myself that would keep me clear. And I found some really great ones, had a couple of great mentors and, and, you know, piece by piece, found some stuff that really worked for me. And I turned around and used those with my clients and it turned out it produced exactly the same results that it did for me. More control, more focus, more, you know, more space, you know, psychically and cognitively to focus on meaningful stuff. So that was really cool. And then some, you know, major guy, head of human resources in a big corporation saw what I was doing. He said, wow, we need those kind of results in our whole company. How about trying to design, can you design maybe a whole training seminar, you know, that kind of utilizes and teaches what you've come up with here as opposed to just one-on-one. -on -one. So I said, sure. So designed a, a pilot program. We did a pilot program at, for a thousand uh, supervisors, managers, and executives, uh, 1983, 84, Lockheed in California. And it, and it worked. It was quite successful. So like, wow, I'm suddenly thrust into the corporate training world. Uh, and then just by referral, my consulting really became more coaching, you know, bid to senior level people in these companies. Once they took the seminars and knew about what I was doing, then those, they wanted one-on-one -on -one 
help at their desk side where I would literally sit down for two days with an executive and actually walk them through the process and implement it for themselves. So um, fast forward the next 25 years, hundreds of thousands of people going through seminars and mostly in the US and in, in companies where I was doing this work and hundreds of thousands, well, not hundreds, but oh, I don't know. Uh, I think Malcolm Gladwell talks about 10,000 hours. who so kind of makes people expert. I probably spent 50,000 hours, literally one-on-one -on -one desk side with some of the brightest and sharpest and busiest people you'd ever meet. You know, for the most part, implementing this. I, my research was really the first five or 10 years to get it, sort of hone the model down. Uh, <laughs> but then spending a lot of time pretty much validating it in some of the toughest environments you can imagine. So after 25 years, it took me 25 years to figure out, Jonathan, what I'd figured out and that nobody else seemed to have done it and that it was bulletproof. You couldn't punch a hole in it. Mm. And it had, it had become viral in some of the toughest environments you could ever imagine that you'd ever think something like that would go viral in. And uh, so I said, okay, in case I get run over by a bus, I guess I should write the manual. And I got some good coaching that's, hey, David, you know, come on, you better write it down, write a book. So that was the impetus for me to pull the trigger on writing the first version of any way of getting things done, published in 2001. I had no idea how successful that might be. I just needed to get it out of my head and write the manual. Uh, and it turned out that it hit a nerve. Bestseller became international, global, translated in a lot of languages. And then the world started knocking on our door. By this time, you know, I had a bit of a kind of a kind of boutique training and coaching company, just a few, few of us, you know, maybe 25, 30 people, just to meet the demand of, of the, the companies that were coming to us to, to have the, us deliver this work. So we said, hmm, okay, but I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to build a global thing. So we said, well, we need technology and partnerships, basically, with how you get leverage, you know, on that. So, you know, long story short, the next 10 years, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years, that's what we've done is we build a global network now where we have partners all around the world and licensees that we have certified. We have a fairly rigorous certification program to become a master trainer and coach in this methodology. But we have about 30 master trainers around the world and we're officially represented in 73 countries out there where people, if they want to, you know, get GTD and getting things done training, you know, that, 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 you know, basically it's just, it's all in the book. You know, if you get, if you kind of get it, if you read the mm -hmm. book and closely and just go implement it. I've had actually a few people actually do that. Not many, but some people, you know, some <laughs> pretty sharp people actually read the book and went, Oh my God. And they just took a weekend and literally implemented the whole thing. And it's stayed on board ever since pretty rare because it's kind of daunting. There's a lot of stuff in there. I mean, it's 25 years of my work. And so now, uh, you know, my work became quite virtual. My wife and I wanted to get out of the U S and get out of U S centric thinking. And we picked Europe as a place to go and, uh, could have been any city as long as I'm near an airport. <clears throat> We'd been to Amsterdam, loved it. Um, it's kind of a perfect storm of all the cool stuff. It's a foreign enough country to be an adventure, but everybody speaks English here. So, you know, so you can get by and it's beautiful. We love the Dutch. We love the country. We love the style. The, the quality of life here is just, is wonderful. Actually, it's terrible. Don't ever come. It's stay away. It's awful. You know, go away, you know, but anyway, so, so, you know, we wound up, you know, basically unhooking from uh, the U S and, so now that's where we are. So I'm in Amsterdam. It's much more the center of the world, of my world, than uh, than uh, Santa Barbara was, you know, where it was before. Mm -hmm. By the way, sorry, it's kind of hay fever season here, so I may I may have a sniffle or need to scratch my nose a little bit. So hope no that worries at all. No worries. Thank you for that. Uh, there's a lot there. A, a lot of that just from listening to some other podcasts and and media that you've done. Um, sort of aware of. And then every time I feel like I hear something, it's a little different, I guess, just taking it into practice, because people can read the book. I, I look at it as more of like a handbook or a playbook, um, as opposed to a lot of fluff, self help or business or productivity books. This is really a guide or a manual of how to take these inputs and organize them and actually turn them into something. So for the 2020 listener right now, and there have been a couple editions of the book, but where do you think right now most people get productivity wrong? 
um, with, with all these digital inputs coming at them. And most people maybe didn't ever grow up with a physical in-tray or they didn't grow up in a world where they couldn't be accessed 24 seven. So I'm curious uh, if, if that is the issue, you know, do you think there's a way to fix it? Or do you think there are other broad issues that are preventing people from being quote unquote productive today or getting the most out of their work? Well, if you know what you're doing, it's a great time to be alive. If you don't, you're screwed. <laughs> I mean, sorry, that's, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't know what you're doing, it's very easy to be totally distracted by all the distractibility that's going on out there. You know, it's so easy to let yourself get addicted to social media stuff and get sucked into that. If you're, if you, if as a way to avoid doing stuff, you probably ought to be doing given, you know, strategy or vision or where you want to go or your goals and so forth. Uh, but come on, there's always been distractions. Come on. When I was 14, I'd spent two hours on the telephone with my girlfriend. You know, come on. That was no different than that than being on than, than go being on Facebook or doing Instagram or doing any of that other kind of stuff. Same thing. It's just that's so much more ubiquitous. And what technology has done, technology hasn't really changed anything since the word processor and the spreadsheet. They changed the world. But mm -hmm. since then, for the most part, it's just speed, volume, and connectivity that technology has provided. Right? Things are a lot faster. There's a lot more. Uh, you're a lot more connected to a lot more things you know, that's coming across. So that's the only, that's the only issue uh, really. Mm -hmm. And then, then, so then you, you just need to be, you know, it, it, what it, the good news is, is it challenges people to start to say, are, are you really focused? I met a woman not long ago whose son is 11 years old and he had 5,000 uh, WhatsApp messages on his phone. I said, how is that? He said, he's fine. He just says, no, I just go do my homework. That's just what that is. So, you know, it's pretty cool for an 11 year old to be able to, you know, just be not be so distracted by all that stuff, but that's, that might be rare, you know, to see whatever that's about. But the methodology doesn't change. Everybody still, even, you know, in 50 years from now, when we fly to Jupiter, you still need an in basket. You still need to capture stuff that you can't finish in the moment. You still need to decide the next action on anything. You need to keep track of projects and, and outcomes, you, you know, come on, duh. So, you know, all I did was identify the best practice behaviors of how do you surf on top of your world and, and engage appropriately with your commitments. That's what I figured out. So mm -hmm. the last 35 years have been me just, you know, preaching that gospel, if you will. Uh, sure. That's, that's really interesting. For those that let's say are in project based roles or they're goal setters, what is your difference between let's say a goal a project or an initiative are they the same should they be um approached differently in your mind no they're all the same thing all the same thing in that they're all probably different in terms of how much granularity and detail you need to get them off your mind but mm -hmm. if you're thinking about whether to get a divorce or not that's a project <laughs> if you're thinking about should you give your kid karate lessons or not that's a project are you thinking I need to hire a vice president of finance? That's a project. They're all projects. They're all initiative. You can call it whatever you want. It's some sort of desired outcome. The desired outcome could be, I want to take a vacation, vacation to relax. That's a project. Mm -hmm. they're, all, they're all just desired outcomes, like things that are not true yet in the material world that you would like to have true. So if you take that as the broadest definition, you know, most people in reality, after all these years, most mid to senior level professional people anyway, have between 30 and 100 projects. And I just interviewed a guy who's got 350. Uh, there's no right or wrong about how many you have, but, just, but if you know how to define outcomes as projects, and then once you've defined it as a project, what do you need to do to move the needle toward completion of it or to feel appropriately engaged with how you're you know, managing that commitment? And that's a lot of what the getting things done methodology is about, is identifying what are those things you've committed to. You know, the clarification process, as you may know, Jonathan, or, you know, stage two, you need to capture the stuff that's got your attention. Oh, I need to X, Y, Z. And then you need to decide, okay, great. What are you going to do about it next? What's the next action on that? And by the way, will one action not complete this? If so, what's the project you need to keep track of until it's done? That's the clarification process. 
And then you just organize the results of that. Where do I park a reminder of this project? Where do I park a reminder of the call I need to make or the thing I need to buy at the hardware store, the thing I need to talk to my life partner about mm -hmm. or my client? That's the organized phase. And then you need to make sure you look at the, the external brain. And I'll go back to your initial question. What's in the way? What's been in the way of anybody, their productivity? They're using their head as their office. And it's a crappy office. Yeah. The, the one, many fundamentals of this book helped me tremendously or changed my thought on it. But one of the biggest was feeling like I could wake up every day and know what I should be doing because it was the most important next step or the action that I could control when I either had my phone or my computer or when I was basically prioritized my set of projects. As far as prioritization goes, for someone that feels like they have tons of projects right now, or that executive that you just mentioned with 350 projects, where some people look at that and they, they view them all as equal. What do you tell those people as to stop doing that or to evaluate that? It's what most has your attention on any of that. What thing, if it were handled, completed, resolved, or got appropriately onto cruise control would make the biggest difference and give you, you know, you know, the most space in your brain free you up more. Mm -hmm. well, it's not hard. Mm -hmm. Well, that may, that may be a, a challenging thing for you to answer, you know, but you know, come on, but I can't answer that for you. Only you can. Sure. You have to decide that. And is that, as you talk about in the book, a lot of people are walking around with these open loops at all times where they know there's stuff they could be doing. They have these quote unquote projects, mail, shopping, mom, all these things on a list, but they don't have the identified next step. Is it, do you, do you see it as for most people, that's when the bulb goes off for them, when they can get these projects out of their mind, cleared up for thinking and identify the next step? Because I do see a lot of people, and I'm sure you see this much more than I have in my 26 years, but people can brain dump everything they have on their mind. They can come up with a list that's been brewing for years and it's a couple hundred things. And they do feel a weight lifted, but then they still don't take that next step of identifying the next step. And I like how you put that. It's just which has got the most mind share at the moment. But is that, that seems to me like where most people then get it wrong, that they have all the things out of their head, but they still don't have a next step on them. Can you just sure. talk about your evaluation process of identifying or thinking through next steps? Yeah, the next action thinking is extremely powerful the very next granular, visible, physical thing that you would need to do to move the needle on your mom's birthday, on you know, uh, upping your credit line, uh, up getting tires on your car, uh, hiring the vice president or whatever it is. Um, if you haven't figured out the next action, you haven't finished your thinking because now you've got a commitment about it. Uh, and as soon as, as soon as things keep popping into your head, it just means that you're not yet appropriately engaged with it. That's not a judgment. That's just data. You're not yet appropriately. If, if I need cat food pops into your head more than once, you're inappropriately engaged with your cat. Right? And people say, well, why should I focus on cat food? Well, I don't know. You want the cat to jump on your face at 3 o'clock in the morning? I don't know. It may sound like a simple, silly little thing, but if you don't handle the simple, silly little things, they start to exhaust they start to you know, exhaust wind out of your sails for all the more important things. Because if you don't give appropriate attention to anything that has your attention, it'll start to take more of your attention than it deserves. So anything pops into your head more than once, unless you just like having a thought, just is the, it is the representative of where you still need to apply the clarification and organization process you know, to this stuff. Yeah. And so you don't have to go very far to see where to start to implement it. You know, anybody listening or watching this right now, that their mind has probably gone other places than just listening to you or me. I'd say that's where they need to go. You know, that's where that's that's what you're not yet appropriately engaged with. What is it? What's got your attention? What's your next action? Where do you park a reminder of that action you'll see at the right time? I just discovered the algorithm or the formula about how do you get stuff out of your head without having to finish stuff. Because my objective is a clear head. There's nothing like being present. But, you know, if you, if you haven't written cat food on a post-it on the fridge that somebody's going to see and then take to the store and get cat food at the right time, 
I, you can be, you can do as much mindful meditation as you want, but you know, cat food's still going to pop in there and get in the way. Very true. So that I, 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 there are a couple points that I've gone back to in the book many times to underline or just think back through one, just the, I would call like the golden rule of the book, getting thoughts out of your head so you can use it for thinking. That that one for me, when I heard it, it just was a game changer, just a total shift. Um, but I think a lot of people, what they're still doing is maybe using it as a bank for these thoughts or they're maybe, you know, having scattered systems. So then I guess just um, transition, before we transition, actually, th this just popped up. I was thinking of it. How do you define or um, think about or advice for someone that, is maybe stuck in procrastination mode or analysis by paralysis mode, or maybe they have their identified next steps, but they just can't muster up the energy or the will to do these next steps. If it's to make the calls or to go out and do the activity, any advice for procrastinators or analysis paralysis? Well, just make sure that you've got the very, very just simple, discrete next action. The people who procrastinate the most, are the most sensitive, creative, and intelligent people because they're the people that can freak themselves out faster than anybody else when they think about this new real estate client or this new investment or this new, oh my God, I've never done that before. Oh my God, let me go play solitaire on my computer. That would be so much more easy to do. Give me a sense of completion. And sometimes that's not a bad thing to do. Sometimes you just need to go do some dummy things. You need to go just wash the dishes or vacuum the floor or clean a drawer. Sometimes you just need to do that so you can get your brain back into gear again and get back in the driver's seat of your life. But it's all those other things, you know, that, that people tend to freak themselves out about stuff that they don't feel like they can control immediately successfully when they first engage with it. Yes. How do I have this conversation with my life partner about whether we should get divorced or not? Oh my God, I don't know where to start. Let me procrastinate about that. I don't, I've never hired anybody before. How do I, I, I don't know what to do next. Uh, how do I procrastinate about that? Uh, I mean, just go on and on and on. Anybody who's procrastinating about anything is probably because they just don't feel like they can engage. The, you know, the barrier to engagement is too high. It's like trying to tell your seven-year-old to go clean his or her room. They go, oh my God. I mean, you tell them to go clean the room. That's like, let me tell you, hey, John, I'm going to go clean up your life. Ah, I don't think so. We'll try to tell a seven-year-old, go clean the room. They're going to freak out with all the stuff they might have to think about and might have to do with it, and they're not going to go do it. And I've had parents that sort of got GTD and got this game that started to go, okay, let's create a game. Let's go get a big box. Let's go gather all the stuff that's not where it needs to be. And they put it on the big box. And then let's take them out one at a time and see how fast we can decide where they go. You know, out of the mouths of babes. Hmm. Right? So if you've started to implement this, that's what you started to do. Right. You started to not freak yourself out with all the stuff you have to do, but started to just inventory it, put it in one place and realize you can go through them one at a time and put them in the right place. That's what you need to do. Yeah, that sums it up so well, because I think it's it's people exactly that. It's just this gray area. Like if someone wants to buy a house like anything, clean your room. Um, it's it's there's so many things they guess they could do or at once, but you can only do one thing at a time and you can only do your next step that you're, you're able to do. And that is appropriate for you to do based on, you know, the, the level of steps or the order of the steps. So it's, it's interesting to think about that. I guess that's just a good natural segue into some of the systems to do this. I mean, I know you've been asked many times about which system or what, what tool is better than what. And I know a lot of times your default answer is, this can be done just as well on pen and paper, a notebook. Um, I know you've said other times you use Lotus Notes, which some people listening to this may have never heard of or they're, they're not familiar with. But as far as tools go, uh, for someone that hasn't read the book, what, what do you identify as the main uh, handful of tools that are needed um, for, let's say, the capture process and then for the implementation process? Yeah, well, for capture, you basically need low tech for the most part, pen and paper. You know, at my desk, eternally, right here. Because as you and I are talking, I may think of something or something may show up, you know, or my wife may come in and say, oh, oh and I say, no, I'm on a, she says, okay, can you? And she may write something on this for me. You know, and then this gets torn off and thrown into my in basket, which is right here. Hmm. So low tech 
no batteries required, no Wi-Fi required. They're ubiquitous anywhere. And the older you get, the more material you get. It's not senility, it's sophistication that your good ideas about things won't happen where you're going to implement that idea. You'll be buying bread at the store thinking something can bring up in the marketing meeting. You'll be in the marketing meeting remembering you need bread. So if you want to be lean, you know, someone has called GTD lean for the brain, if you know the, the idea of sort of the, you know, no waste, you know, in the workflow. And so no waste, don't have a thought more than once. But in order to not have a thought more than once, you better have a ubiquitous capture tool. And, you know, too many clicks on the phone. There are some people that are pretty good at being able to do that. They've gotten their phone down and they, you know, they, they can do that, you know, automatically. It's with them all the time. They just have to punch one click and they can record stuff and that's their in basket. But they need to be pretty rigorous, disciplined GTDers to really make that work. But it's possible. So you could capture things digitally if you want, but 98% of my capture is all low tech, mm -hmm. you know, cause that's with me. You know, my, my little wallet with is with me all the time, wherever I go, wherever I need plastic, you know, like, Hey, come on, that's there. Fits in my pocket. The jeans fits in a tux fits anywhere. So that's always there. So that's the, that's the capture tool. Low tech can't beat uh, in terms of implementation once I decide if there's a next action on there that I can't finish in a couple of minutes, you know, and I need to keep track of that action reminder, that's when I need to go to a list. So the systems for most people just need to be whatever manages lists for people appropriately. And there are hundreds and hundreds of both digital list managers as well as paper-based list managers. And you can, any one of them works as I, as, as, as you said, I've said. You know, <laughs> so the, the methodology is system independent it's system required. You need some external brain. You need, you, you can't keep, you know, your brain is so seductive. You know, Jonathan, you'll think of something, say, oh, that's so obvious. I'll know I'll never forget that. Two minutes later, you'll be thinking of the next obvious thing. You forgot, you forgot the first thing, but it didn't go away. It actually then went back into a bank that's contributing to what I now call, if you say, what's the biggest issue out there right now? It's not overwhelm. I used to say, I used to talk about this just gets rid of the sense of overwhelm, but most people listening to this are not really feeling overwhelmed. Overwhelm is when your building catches on fire, you're overwhelmed with, oh my God, I need to survive, right? And you handle that. Mm -hmm. The real issue is what I now refer to as ambient anxiety, this vague sense that there's stuff out there you probably would, could, should, ought to be doing, but you forgot what the hell it was. It might be more part of whatever you're doing. Oh my God. And then these weird random things pop into your head at three o'clock in the morning that you can't do shit about. And that's the biggest issue right there. And that's this creating this sort of subliminal thing that's happening when people are trying to keep track of the would, could, shoulds, need, need tos, might want tos inside their head instead of an external system. Mm -hmm. I've heard you talk about it. I'm curious if, if this is the same concept as similar to a computer with CPU, memory, and cache that you have thoughts spinning in the back of your head at all times. A common answer you hear when you ask someone how they're doing these days is busy or overwhelmed or I've got a lot going on. But in the moment, I feel like they could probably, they would struggle to list off the top priorities or the next steps on most of those things because they have so many open loops in their head. So is that a newer thought that you just, that you just mentioned or is it? No, it's just a descriptive of the results of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That makes sense. So, I mean, there, it, it, oh, come on. A whole lot of people have just know about GTD, but haven't implemented it because life's okay. Ambient anxiety is okay. Overwhelm would not be real. Overwhelm would not be okay, but ambient anxiety, they're willing to tolerate. That's why, you know, I, I've, I've often said it's people's addiction to stress that keeps them from implementing this stuff. And, but it's not so much a, an obvious stress. It's the ambient anxiety that people most just walk around and live in and don't even know there's another way to get out of it or don't even know there's an out of it. Hmm. They don't know what it's like to have actually nothing on their mind, being as busy as they are. Ambient anxiety, you're saying, is okay for most because it, it won't kill you. It won't lead to immediate harm. But for someone like you, I doubt you would say for yourself that ambient anxiety is okay. Of course not. I, I hate it. I love clear space. That's why I do this stuff I teach. You know, this in-basket is empty. 
my email is almost empty. I got about five in there right now. Because when I'm not doing anything else, I'm cleaning up backlog simply because, you know, there's the surprises and change coming toward me. I can't see. And when that hits, the smaller my backlog, the easier it is to make quick decisions intuitively and intelligently about mm -hmm. what to do and what not to do about any of that. But if you, if you got a big backlog of still unprocessed, unclarified, unorganized stuff, you don't know whether there's anything sitting in there that's more important than that new thing coming at you. So even if that new thing coming at you is cool, it's going to piss you off. It's going to bother you. It's going to disturb you because you're going to go, oh, yeah, but uh, I don't know because I got other stuff. Oh, my God. For a lot of people listening to this right now, they may be using their email as a to-do list. And there are some people that advocate to do this. There are some people that advocate to not. Um, we can get into like specifics of systems. I have a couple you know, personal questions about systems, but just on that one question, do you, do you think that is a, uh, would you say that's an okay way to do it from working with a lot of executives? Have you seen that? strategy be effective or do you recommend against it? Well, first of all, if they're just using the in basket in their email as reminders of stuff to do, as long as they don't have more than a screen full, I'd say, yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. you know, as long Because as, they can see it all pretty quick and uh, imagine they're going to try to get through it pretty soon. That's rare to only have a, just a screen full. Mm -hmm. Or if you've already created a folder system inside your email, so you could drag emails over. That's a call, call to make, and that's an action I need to take, and that's whatever. So that your in basket is not is really still an in basket where you can you're using it to actually process your stuff, and still using emails as reminders. That's fine as long as you live in email. And, and the email folder would be just like looking at a list. Mm -hmm. Right. The problem yep. is is out of sight, out of mind, and so you drag it over to the folder. You know, you, you, you're you're not. You, you know, if you actually emptied your email in basket, you feel so excited, you just go party hardy and never look at any of those folders. So, right. you, know, so the, you have to have a, the rigor or the directionality or the habits of being able to make sure you're looking at all your open loops as often as you need to, to feel comfortable about what you're not doing. Mm -hmm. And as you talk about in the book, is, is that when you would say, if someone is using a calendar as a, quote unquote, to do list, or they're using their inbox as let's say an action basket to then use the calendar to then appropriate or block off times that they have those activities segmented. So I can block off that hour that I need to do computer tasks on a computer, but it'll be blocked on my calendar or would, would you say that could, could not work? If anybody has a stable enough life to be able to trust that, I'd say, fine. I've never met one. <laughs> right. I never met anybody that didn't blow the hell out of their own, gee, I'd like to, as they put it on their calendar. <laughs> you know, so, right. But, but if, if it, there's, no right, there's no right or wrong about that, there's inefficient. If you're not completing those things or holding your own agreements to what you're doing during those time frames. So as soon as you give those up, you're screwed. You won't, you won't trust yourself. You won't trust your system. It'll all go back in your head again, and you'll feel bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 100%. I guess I'm just trying to knock down a lot of the, I don't want to say excuses, but maybe potential dominoes or, or blocks that people maybe put up to why they can't use a system like this or their life doesn't fit in this box, which I, as people that um, I know, they just love the feeling of being busy or that, that quote unquote, you know, background anxiety. But I think for a lot of them, they have this running list of maybe these non-actionable items, you know, an item that maybe they can reference or they can't reference, but they, they don't know what it should be. And with just so much email going on now and they're living in their inbox, it seems like that is something I see all too, too much where let's say I'm walking around an office and everyone just has their email up and that is their to-do list of just their next ding activity to do. And some remedies I've heard to that and, you know, put in practice myself for if I'm going to use my inbox for that purpose is to put it on airplane mode. You can put your Outlook or your Gmail on airplane mode where you won't get any new in commands. You can only focus outbound. So I guess just hearing that, I mean, the moral of the story is, to your point, from when we kicked off the conversation, the distractions aren't new. They're just repackaged. 
that a lot of this stuff was the same from when you were, let's say 14, as far as there are always distractions and you just need a better way to process or take command or control the next steps that go outbound. So I guess from just putting a, a, like a loop on all this and tying it up is, is that kind of the moral of the story that from then to now, it's really just a matter of having an effective system to process all these inputs. It really hasn't changed all that much. It's just being able to step back and take control of all this activity in your life. Sure. Mm-hmm. Well, we're teaching eight, nine and 10 year olds this, you know, they have the same process and, you know, we just published last year, the getting things done for teens, for teenagers. Hmm. And it's the same methodology. There's no change in that. It's just different content. You know, CEO coming back from a board meeting still needs to empty their briefcase and whatever their meeting notes were and whatever the business cards they collected or receipts for lunch or whatever. And they still need to decide what to do with that. And a nine-year-old needs to open his or her pack and make sure that the note from the teacher goes to mom so she can sign it as opposed to getting lost for two weeks. So same, same, same idea. There's the same principles, the same techniques. It's the same best practice. There's different content. But that mm-hmm. doesn't change. And it won't change. You know, that's why I, I don't have to change. I'm so lazy. I, it's wonderful. I've just wound up creating a career out of, you know, just a few things that I know and best practices I know, and I don't have to change anything I say, no matter who I talk to. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how sophisticated you are. I don't care where you live on the planet. I don't care whether you're male or female, none of that, because this is a, such a human issue, you know, about people collect anybody with a busy life. Anyway, it's mm-hmm. not just in true survival mode, you know, that's need to keep track of anything. You know, your head's just a crappy office and the new cognitive science of data is like four things max that you can keep in your head before you start to diminish your cognitive process. In all of your years of consulting and in when you're doing, let's say your, your actual like corporate days or even post um, post that, or then after the book came out, have there been any specific standout uh, people you've seen that have implemented this approach and the difference that it's made in their life or, or specific, there's, there's hundreds or thousands um, or testimonials that you've seen before and after where they just couldn't get their life organized and then things more or less just took off after they could put a system on their inputs. Yeah. Well, probably the most public person that I can say, because he was quite verbal about this for months, a guy named Howard Stern, right? It's changed his life. Huh. He'd tell you that. Okay. Um, did not know he's a GTD or. Oh yeah. Serious. As a matter of fact, my coach that coached him is now his COO and you know, he hired her just changed his life, gave him room to paint, learn to paint, which he'd never been able to do before. You know, he'd been frustrated, thought he was going to have to give up Sirius and all the other businesses he was doing just because it was so out of control. And uh, sort of, he got religion, you know, so he's a Hmm. a serious, you know, serious poster, poster child of sort of implementation of this and how it so much changed his perception anyway of his world. It allowed him to keep the world he was in as opposed to give it up. Have you met him? Have you spent time with him? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mutual, mutual fanboys. Yeah, <laughs> actually, before I left, before I left California, we we wound up having breakfast together. And it was really great. So we both hugged each other. Of course, he's he's seriously tall, you know, so <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, you know, that Howard's is good. funny. Yeah. Are there are there any others that come to mind as people that, um, or you really respect or admire that now use GTD as a system, or it impacted their life? that maybe the public would know? Oh, lots of folks. Ariana Huffington's an old friend of mine and, you know, coached her years ago with this stuff. So she's still doing versions of that. Jim Kim, who just left as the head of the World Bank, is, has been a serious student of my stuff for years. Hmm. And every time he changed, you know, he was heading the World Health Organization. Then he went to head up Dartmouth College and then he went to head up the World Bank. He said every time he made those changes, he had to go read my book again because he had to sort of recalibrate himself for you know, sort of the new position that he was in. It's funny, his mom taught, um, I think, theology and Zen or or Oriental philosophies or whatever at University of Idaho or somewhere like that. His mom turned him onto my book. She said, hey, Jim, you know, this is just practical Zen because he's a a practicing Zen, uh, you know, adherent. And so Mm -hmm. it allowed him to start to actually have time to sit and meditate while he was at the World Bank. His presenting issue to me was, he said, David, when I go home with my young kids on the weekend, I do not want to take the World Bank with me. 
So he was pretty fast adopter of all this stuff. Do you see a lot of themes or overlap in, let's say, um, Buddhist methodology or um, I guess that frame of mindset or even in karate or martial arts that I know you've explored and, and um, taken up seriously as a hobby. Do you see a lot of that as overlap in, in as far as quieting your mind and controlling your mind to sure. then be able to execute just, just when you need to? Absolutely. Anything you can do, you know, good food, good enough sleep, meditation, you know, uh, yoga, all those things you know, are quite useful in, in, in that regard. They don't deal with what this deals with uh, because you can meditate, med you know, do yoga, whatever, but if you still got these open loops hang hanging around yourself psychically or cognitively, you know, the, those will help you be more relaxed about how you engage with them if you engage with them, but if you're still avoiding your engagement with them, um, good luck. So, you know, your meditative practices, again, you know, I, I've meditated for 50 years. So, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, this work, the getting things done thing is not so much spiritual work, unless you kind of look at it with a very small S. It's kind of like, it's all, it's all that. Um, but really, it, it's about being able to create the space that, to then use that space with however you want to use it. See, I can guarantee over the, all the years, what the implementation of this methodology does is create space. How you use that space is up to you. Jonathan, if you suddenly had absolutely nothing on your mind, you cleared it all out, it had total clear, clean space, nothing on your mind, what would you do? How would you use that space? You, you might use it to be more creative. You might use it to be more strategic. You might use it to be able to really cook spaghetti really well and enjoy the process. You might use it to be able to tuck your kids into bed at night with just being really present. You might use it to be able to watch your daughter play soccer without being on your iPhone. There's a lot of ways that you would use more space. And so this doesn't, doesn't dictate what you do once you get clear. It just tells you if you're not clear, here's how you get there. And then what you do with that, that's going to be quite unique and up to you. So if you want to use that space to be able to meditate better or to be clearer, to be able to more open to, be, to for the more subtle and sublime things that can go on when you when you quiet yourself in this world uh then yeah helps a ton yeah that's that there's a couple of points in that that i i go back and forth on where people are checking email or checking social media or text and they're saying that's because um well i've heard two very distinct camps on it is one, it's because I, I need to do this for my business. I hear that a lot. I need to be in my text and my email and my social media to be really reactive for my business. And then I've heard the other side of it where people are saying, this is my, my off switch. This is what I can just do to kind of decompress, like talking and texting to friends or interacting on social media. It's kind of just a fun thing for me to do when the lights are off. But I guess just hearing you explain it that way, I guess really all that matters is being able to differentiate and neutrally look at for yourself which is it and have an idea it doesn't matter which but at least being able to neutrally call it what it is and say okay i am decompressing or i am kind of telling myself a little bit of a lie that this really doesn't have to affect my business i just like doing it it's fun for me to just reply to text and get that dopamine hit sure no it's fine i do that yeah you know i check i, I do words with friends you know, <laughs> in the in the morning when i wake up because i have people around the planet you know halfway around the world that they do it while I'm sleeping and I wake up and then I, I play my next words, you know, and then they, they, then they deal with that. Cause it kind of gets my brain sort of charged up a little bit, you know, as well as reading the front page of the New York times and my iPad, one of the first things I do when I'm having coffee. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I check Instagram cause I got folks that are doing cool stuff on there. And, you know, I'd like to kind of see what they do and that's all fun. So you're to your point. Sure. That's a, mm -hmm. that's as good a thing as taking a walk around the park. You know, in terms of getting your brain, let your, letting your brain relax. But again, to your point, you know, are you doing that to avoid doing the stuff you ought to be doing, given your own commitments with yourself? Or are you doing it as a way to just decompress and, you know, change gears and you know, whatever? And any and all that's good stuff. I think the cognitive stuff, I would, you know, there's a friend of mine named Theo Compernale. He's a, a brilliant scientist and 
researcher, psychologist, psychiatrist, or whatever at the University of Brussels. And uh, he's written a great book called Brain Chains, and he's done a lot of research that a lot of the cognitive stuff, if you're trying to do email, you know, uh, at least within an hour of when you're trying to go to sleep, you're not going to have as good a sleep because your brain's going to be trying to think about stuff that you really need to kind of unhook from that. So there's some data out there. I'm not the expert in that area, but there's some data out there right now that, that says certain kinds of cognitive things that you're doing, you should not be doing at a certain time in terms of optimizing your ability to let your brain relax and rest. So, mm -hmm. so I, don't, I don't want to pretend that I'm a total expert in that area. There's probably a lot of good data out there other people could get. One last question, I guess, just on, I'd say the, the inner mind and then just ability to focus first turn off uh, and then just activities we like to do for fun. Uh, compared to some of the other, I would say, um, in, in my mind, like idols in this space, productivity or efficiency, or just really coming up with better systems, some of them are, are more or less um, very closed off to, I'd say, these types of conversations, or they're very difficult to schedule, or more or less, they don't look at it uh, as you do, maybe from an experience standpoint, they're looking at it a little bit more from the sense of, this isn't my one thing that I should be focusing on. I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with the book, The One Thing, but, um, or, or even like Free to Focus, uh, uh, another book, Michael Hyatt, where it's, it's more or less the concept of if, if it's not more or less in alignment with your big goal, why are you doing it? So I guess for you right now, are, are you at a place in life where you like to do these types of conversations and this is still something that you look at as, as enjoyment or is it still something that you're putting in like a project bucket that is for the book or both? I'm just curious because a lot of the others or even like a Tim Ferriss, um, who a lot of people look up to as someone in productivity, they can't be reached like for 11 out of 12 months a year. They're, they're living in a cave basically, you know, like they're, they're not reachable to the world, but for you, I, I get a different feeling that um, maybe it's both, but I'm just curious to hear your, your opinion on, you know, doing this type of stuff and your, your public, you know, kind of persona and um, communication style. Yeah. Well, my professional purpose anyway, is to create a world where there are no problems, only projects. So you give me an opportunity to, and to, to, to make that happen, I can't, I couldn't turn it down. Mm -hmm. Couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. I couldn't stop talking about this if I tried. Because it's, mm -hmm. I think it's the most important stuff that I know that I would tell somebody to improve their condition in life and nothing better than being of service to people to improve their condition if they're interested in it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, prosel I'm not a proselytizer. I'm not a motivational speaker. You know, mm -hmm. Basically, I'm just... I'm really more, was more of a researcher and then an educator. And then just, Hey, if you want it, let me tell you something. And I don't care whether you do this or not. I do, or I wouldn't have written the book and I wouldn't take the time to share this with people, but how much of this or anybody listening to this buys into up to them. You know, my job was to give you the information and that I know very well. So, you know, if I do that and then can, can manage uh, to, you know, maintain a, a career and a lifestyle. You know, I'm not particularly ambitious or, or uh, entrepreneurial, or, you know, or aspirational even in terms of just, you know, making a lot of money or whatever. I just would like to want to have a lifestyle that's comfortable that I can keep doing this kind of stuff. So, yeah. So I both enjoy it, but one of the reasons I enjoy it is because it's very purposeful for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes total sense. And it aligns with, it seems like something you like to do, but it does also mainly align with your vision and your goals and purpose. So it's, it's cool to hear your thought logic on that. Um, I'm just curious, since a lot of this group is a younger audience, um, I don't ask this question to every guest, uh, but I'm, I'm curious with you, especially because you've had such an interesting, I'd say, uh, an unconventional route into productivity. And as you just kind of alluded to, you're not the typical... Um, goal setter, I need to be rich, I, I need to take over the world type mentality that I hear a lot. And it's very common in the productivity space. So with that, I'm curious, what advice would you tell yourself or any millennial listening to this, really trying to get their arms around life or what they want to take on? Let's say they're a new college graduate in 2020 coming into the COVID world, and they're, they're just trying to figure things out a little bit better, you know, or, or to yourself in that case. 
Yeah. Well, the, you can't beat two things. First of all, give yourself permission to embarrass yourself with your own fantasy about how wildly successful your life could be. What would you really, really, really love to be able to do and to say that you do to other people? And then back up and say, what experience do you think that would give you? And then start to clarify what it is that you want as the, the experience of the fantasy. So it's absolutely fine to have the fantasy and change the fantasy when you get older and you know, have other visions of it, but that's fine to have it. But also then uh, explore the nature of that fantasy. What do you think it would give you? A sense of freedom, a sense of expression, a sense of, of confidence, a sense of clarity, a sense of service to the world, a sense of something or other. Because your own experience is as valuable an outcome as the physical material outcome that you might want. Not only that, when you actually identify what the experience is, you may look around and go, wow, I could start to have that experience right now, more of that if I did X, Y, and Z. So have the fantasy, decide what the inner drive of that fantasy is, and then look around and say, how could I start to support that inner desire for that experience with things I could do that are available to me right now? Mm -hmm. I got that coaching 35 years ago and that I haven't looked back since. Who was your first coach or who was the coach that gave you that advice? Actually, a friend of mine named Ted Drake. Hmm. Uh, he was just an interesting guy. Uh, and you know, he just asked me what my fantasy was. And I gave him some answer and he said, what do you think it would give you? And I went, hmm. I think what it gave me was the opportunity to be able to have people's attention so I could share, you know, what I think would be valuable stuff that would improve their lives. Is that mm -hmm. great? David, what could you do right now that would start to give you the ability to have more people, people, more people's attention. Right. So you could then communicate with them. And I mm -hmm. went, ah, okay. I remember exactly the lunch we had and where it was. It was in West Los Angeles. Hmm. Very cool. Well, David, uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I uh, got to ask a lot of questions that I've thought about since reading the book. And, and people have asked me just as far as how to be more productive or balance things and manage activities and inputs that are um, – they feel, and I felt this before coming at an all time high, but after having this conversation, I, I can safely say, I feel a little bit more at ease that the distraction has always happened and the distraction will be the same as you said, when we're going to, I don't remember Jupiter or Pluto in uh, 50 years, but it, it's always there. And it's just kind of that background noise that you can either um, fight or you can um, come up with a solution to. So David, with that, uh, I don't want to keep you past time here. I just want to say thank you again for coming on. Um, what's the best way for people to reach you or uh, follow you on social media? Um, maybe your Instagram handle, anything like that, that they can uh, get connected with you and then start uh, adopting and following the principles of the book. And sure. your thinking. Well, our website, gettingthingsdone.com, is a good place to be. And I've just put in 25 two-minute tips for turbulent times. Uh, little videos that I've just made. So if you go to the website and gettingthingsdone.com slash T T T T four T's for two minute tips for turbulent times. And uh, you may find some very practical things, especially if you're having a very changed situation these days, given what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and we got a free newsletter comes out cool stuff on that. Uh, we do podcasts regularly. So stay in touch. Uh, that's a great way to stay in touch. I'm D Allen 45 on Instagram. I'm GTD guy on Twitter. Okay, so. cool. Uh, one, one last question, actually, I just, for, for you, I know spreading the message is, is so valuable and for people getting a, a better sense of their life, they can, they can adopt the information and use it if they want. But for someone, I guess, just looking to reach out to you, um, something that I talk about often is uh, for people that, or trying to bring value to someone or maybe start a relationship. A lot of times they're asking for something before they try to add something. Is there anything that someone could do to add value to your life right now 
um, to maybe start things off on the right foot if they were reaching out in any way? Uh, just, you know, I love hearing from people about any success they have with this methodology. Mm -hmm. um, and we certainly can always use testimonials of people who actually do that because people love to hear third party validation of this stuff. And I've got partners all around the world now sort of distributing and trained, doing these trainings and coachings and their, their businesses now are based on the success of the brand. So, you know, anything people can do to spread the word you know, would be helpful. Be very appreciated. Okay, great. Well, David, thank you so much again. Um, really enjoyed it and all the best in 2020 and beyond. Uh, same to you, Jonathan. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey, you millennial millionaire, do you want more? Then head to the Millennial Millionaires Through Real Estate Facebook group, where there are tons of step-by-step -step walkthroughs, tools, templates, and free networking to help you achieve financial freedom through real estate. And if you want Jonathan to help you personally reach your goals, then feel free to set up a one-on-one -on -one call in the link below or message him on any social media platform and apply to, well, work with Jonathan.